you know, um, when we think about uh, the costs of um, reducing uh, pollution, or the costs for an agriculture for in agriculture of adapting to a warmer climate, the farmers themselves and the innovators, the people who are technologists themselves, know a lot more about those things than do um, like sort of a panel of scientific experts. So all of these share the fact that just scientific uh, expertise and data collection is really not going to get you all the information that you need to address these problems. And this is really true for a quite broad class of cases. Anytime when there's some subjective existence value for having something like a culture or preserving a language, preserving uh, species, etc. Um, and while some expert, uh, you, this could just be assigned by an expert, this should, could just be an expert who's in charge of figuring out how much that is. But other people might think, well, it depends on how much individual people in our society value that thing existing. Um, another time when this happened is, you know, imagine that you have a house and you're, uh, it's been in your you know, family for generations. Only you really know how much you value that house, right? But it's not based on its objective economic value. It's based on a subjective value that the house has for you, right? Um, and so anytime there's sort of something that you value in a very idiosyncratic, personal way, it's going to be really hard to determine that purely based on an objective economic analysis. And finally, um, you know, local information about technology or about the impacts of various things uh, can be very important, as we talked about with agriculture and with the innovations. Yeah? I agree with one and three, but two, like, you could easily get a value of a property, right? Like, if I have a price that is, like, at market value, and you decline it, then clearly you have a high, and then, like, there would be a price, right? That, like, well, like, no, I, I agree with what you're saying, Ben, but you can only, like, I, I, so I totally agree that there are ways to get these out of people, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the class. But the point is you couldn't do that without interacting with the relevant person, right? In other words, you have to try to get, I mean, I could just come up to you and say, how much do you value it? That might work. I mean, it might not, but it might work, right? And, but the point is I can't get that by just doing a scientific analysis or, like, you know, collecting data. I have to actually talk to the person. You know what I mean? You don't think you could do, like, you could ask like X number of people about their house property at, that they have that which they have like a certain other value to that's not because it's in their family and then you'd probably come up with like well you could have a distribution but you probably couldn't figure out for an individual so imagine that there was like a hurricane and it was only going to wipe out one guy's house you might know from other people what the distribution of people's willingness to pay to keep their houses but you wouldn't know what that individual person was and so you, it would be hard to figure out what the exact externality was of that hurricane. Um, okay, so when such information is very important um, and there's no way around trying to gather it, then what we have to do is try to find some way to get it out of people, as Ben was just talking about. We have to, you know, maybe try to get them to buy or sell the thing that we're talking about, or we need to ask them, or something like that, right? Um, and. We don't want this information just to be their opinion or somebody else's opinion or a guess. We want it to, um, uh, we want them to give us whatever personal information they have about uh, the thing they value. And by that we mean not that um, just whatever they value the thing at is by definition what it's worth but rather that we think there might be something that they actually genuinely know, like this has been in their family for generations or something, which is relevant to how we as a society value them losing that. Right? So one example of this might be the inherent value of cultures. So um, this is a difficult issue. So a lot of people think it's a bad thing if there's an ancient civilization that, like, the um, language is now dying out because of modern culture, and then we want to try to preserve that and maybe give subsidies to keep uh, people speaking that language. And there's basically two approaches we can take to thinking about that. One is we could say, look, we as a society just put the following amount of value on it 
and we're going to come up with that on the basis of some philosophical argument. Another approach is to say, well, look, we value it as a society to the extent that each individual person in our society values it, and we don't know how much each person values it, so we might have to take some sort of a survey to figure that out. Um, and uh, if we do need to take that sort of a survey, that's sort of the, the most natural first approach is literally to go around and take a survey. And in fact, that's a very traditional and simple approach that has a very long history. It's called contingent valuation, which is a little bit of a fancy word for just a survey. Um, and all that it means is what you do is you go to people, you describe different situations, you ask how much individuals would be willing to pay to have situation A rather than situation B, and then you assume that this is how much they're truly willing to pay for that, um, and you use that to determine uh, you know, how much externalities are created by changes in different situations. The most common uh, thing for which this is used is environmental issues, uh, such as uh, the value of creating, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll talk about some examples in a moment. It's also used to determine how much people would be willing to pay um, for a new transportation route or for a new bridge, or a new building, or some other public work. Um, so, uh, Mike, um, what are some examples of you know, things for which continued valuation has been used? Like the type of questions you want to ask? Yeah, like, what, like what, do, what, what do continued valuation surveys like try to gauge people's values for? Uh, like a good example might be like animals, so like how much would you value if there was an oil spill? Or <coughs> yeah, that, that's a great example. You know, yeah. uh, preserving visibility at the Grand Canyon is one famous example. Um, preserving seals or whales in the ocean. Avoiding logging of national forests. Uh, value of birds killed by the Exxon Valdez. These are all actually real examples that people have done and that have influenced public policy. Value of preserving a language or an, uh, of an indigenous culture, value of a new building in a city. And these tend to be commissioned in practice, and they're commissioned, I would say there's probably a thousand of these or something like that. I mean, this is a, this is a huge industry that does stuff like this. Commissioned by regulatory agencies, courts, governments, etc. cetera. Um, and the benefits, uh, these form part of a benefit cost analysis of externalities, regulations, and other actions by governments, they're also often used to assess the damage caused by an oil spill. So when there's something like the Deepwater Horizon, some, I bet there were quite a few continued valuation surveys run to determine how much liability they had for the you know, number of, uh, of birds that they killed. And almost all of these are formal and money-based. That is, they say, situation A, situation B, <coughs> how much would you pay to get situation A versus situation B, but sometimes they're also a bit more informal than this. So sometimes they're just surveys of public opinion, like, you know, how bad do you think this would be, or do you support or not support the following? Um, and these aren't exactly the same as <coughs> valuation because they're usually sort of binary, but they have some similarities and, some, and they have similar types of impacts on public policy sometimes. Because politicians look a lot at public opinion polls about questions, right? And so, in some ways, you can think of the whole public opinion polling industry as sort of a very simplified example of doing contingent valuation study. Okay. <coughs> now, economists are pretty darn skeptical of contingent valuation studies for the most part. And Steve, what, why do you think that's the case? Because uh, <coughs> it's hard for... Uh individuals to put a price on, on that because they don't really know what the situation is like it, it, if yeah. you're there as opposed to thinking about it. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very important reason. So people, one thing is that people just don't even take these things seriously. Like, I don't know if you've ever gotten one of these surveys, but it's sort of like, okay, leave me alone, you know? Like, you give some answer, but you don't think about it at all, right? Um, I mean, would you guys, if someone came in and asked you this, like really sit there and like, try to figure it out much, or would you just like try to get rid of the guy? You know? Uh, the other thing is, often they give the answer to the wrong question in some sense. So they say how much they're willing to, how much they think sort of society overall should be willing to pay for this. 
rather than how much personally would it hurt them if this happened. But that, how much it would personally hurt them is what matters. You know, a lot of times people either say uh, how much society should be willing to pay, or they think of it like a charity. You know, it's like, oh, I, I'm going to give some money to stop this bad thing from happening, but not because it actually harms me, just because I think it would be bad for the world, right? So it's very hard to get people to actually answer the question that you want them to answer. Um, another uh, thing is that, as Steve pointed out, people often have no clue about this stuff. Like, you know, for example, if you say, how much would you be willing to pay to keep some African language group that you've never heard of from, you know, going, from stopping speaking it, you might answer something, but like, you have no idea, is this like some incredibly important historical language that like you, we should value a lot, or is this like something that a guy made up one day, and you started speaking with his friends, and now they've all decided that this is stupid, uh, and they want to stop speaking it, right? So I mean, it's just like really hard, I mean, you just don't have the facts. And, you know, a lot of these environmental things are really extreme like that. It's like, you know, there's some forest you've never heard of. How much are you willing to pay to keep that forest there? It's like, well, maybe it's an incredibly important forest that's like host to some amazing ecosystem. Or maybe it's like some guy's backyard. You know, <laughs> you really have no idea. So um, it really takes a lot of reflection and thought to figure out a thoughtful answer to this. And most people aren't going to put that in. Um, Another thing is that a lot of people's answers are motivated not by like what they actually would be willing to pay or even what they think would be good for society, but like what they think either the survey uh, giver wants to hear or what they think other people would think well of them for. So you know, given that there's no consequences for the decision that they're making, they might as well say they'd be willing to pay a million dollars to preserve you know, the seagulls because, every, because then they can like pat themselves on the back and say, oh, I'm such a good person, I'd pay all this money for the seagulls, even if they never actually would, because they you know, aren't forced to. So, um, the other thing, which is sort of indicative of all this stuff, and that just the methodology is very flawed, is that if you ask the question one way, you get one answer. If you ask the question another, apparently identical, but you know, just slightly reworded way, you can get something that's like two or three orders of magnitude different. So it's sort of like, you know, it's not very clear that this is going to be a useful way for, for people to think about it. And also, these are situations that people are never, never think about, right? You know, if you ask me how much am I willing to pay to get like a slightly better orange juice, that's a decision I have to make every day, right? So I might have a good sense for that. If you ask me how much I'm willing to pay for one of these things, it's like, I have no idea. I've never thought about that. I've never had to worry about that. So like, why should you think that the person will have any sense of what the right answer is? And then, you know, yeah. So, uh, with all those problems, this is, a lot of economists think this is a bunch of nonsense. However, that's not the worst of it. So, actually, uh, the worst problem comes when there are actually incentives um, involved in this. So, uh, it, and the incentives depend on what the survey is actually used for. So one thing the survey could be used for is like for us to talk about in class and for like economists to think about, in which case it has no effect on the world, basically, right? So what are people's incentives in this case, uh, Ben? Um, they're just like, like who the people taking Yeah, them. yeah. There are none? Like there are no effects. Yes, yeah, so it's sort of like, yeah, whatever. It's sort of like what we just talked about. It's like sort of whatever, uh, the other people, right? Yeah, so in that case, people don't really care, right? Um, which is itself is pretty problematic, right? For all the reasons we just talked about. Uh, and in fact, it's not even clear why people are even willing to take the survey other than their own personal entertainment. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these continued evaluation surveys are used for nothing more than sort of like economists to talk about. And so, I don't think people take them very seriously. Um, but, uh, Bill, what if these surveys actually did affect public policy? Then what would people's incentives be like? 